Hello and welcome to another one of my nagging thoughts. I want to take a quick moment and just ask you to please like, subscribe, share, and above all, please do comment. Very much enjoy hearing what your thoughts are in response to my nagging thoughts. So please uh, don't forget to leave a comment. That said, let me turn my attention to this week's topic, which is the question, are abused slaves the inspiration for Christian women in marriage? This seems like an odd question, but if you go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, here's what you're going to read. In the same way, wives be subject to your own husbands. Then, even if some are disobedient to the word, they will be won over with out a word by the way you live. So the question today, there's a lot again to unpack in this passage, first Peter chapter three, verses one through six. But what I want to focus in on today is what is that same way that we are talking about? Well, if you back up to first Peter chapter two, verse 18, what you're going to see is that same way is abused slaves. Here's what it says in first Peter chapter two, verse 18, slaves be subject to your masters with all reverence, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are perverse. I looked it up and the word for perverse here is the word scolios, which means dried out. A word study says it's like a piece of parched wood. Figuratively, it's morally twisted or warped because it's lacking the oil of the Holy Spirit. I assume that can refer to a non-believer, but, uh, because of the example I'm going to show you from the Bible in just a moment, to me, it seems that we are actually talking about believers because we're talking about the oil of the Holy Spirit drying out. So this, to me, is talking about abusive believers, which is what we're talking about. We're talking about Christian marriage. Problem is, First uh, Peter chapter 2, verse 18, immediately conjures up images of the transatlantic slave trade for me as a, an American living in this day and age, and particularly a scene from Roots where Kunta Kinte was being whipped until he submitted to his oppressor's demands to strip him of all his personal dignity and personhood to embrace his assigned slave identity as Toby, whose job it was to be used and abused. That's what this verse is conjuring up for me. And I'm not alone in understanding this passage this way. Pastors have looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 6 to leverage the authority of God to morally compel Christian women into staying in marriages with physically abusive husbands. If you need some examples of that, I want to point you to The Life-Saving Divorce, which is a book coming out by Gretchen Baxkerville. And I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name. I've just come across her content recently on Twitter, and it is amazing in a very uh, heavy way, um, disheartening way. I'm doing all these nagging thoughts, sharing all this information because my hope is that the body of Christ can heal these wounds and do better. Um, I'm ashamed that these are things going on within the Christian community. Um, that be, so that being said, I want to say as a believer that if you are a man, a woman, or a child, and you are in danger, Proverbs says that only the naive, some render it as the fool, would ignore that type of risk and go on as if the threat wasn't real. I want to point your attention particularly to Proverbs 22 verse 3 and Proverbs 27 12. Here's what the first one says and they're almost identical. It says a shrewd person sees danger and hides himself but the naive keep right on going and suffer for it. If you are in danger get out and hide yourself. If you perceive a threat, I want to encourage you to follow King David's example with his relationship with King Saul. Run and hide. Both uh, King David and King Saul were anointed by God, and although Saul had the spirit, it dried up, and it be he became possessed by a spirit of torment, jealousy, and paranoia. 
So he became this scolios authority, which is what we're talking about back in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Saul first repeatedly, passively, aggressively put David in harm's way, which displayed his indifference to David's safety. And when that didn't actually hurt David, Saul aggressively tried to kill David, which displayed his active desire to destroy David. Even though David desired to serve the man anointed by God and stay in the kingdom that God anointed him to rule, once David understood the threat of harm was real, he ran for the hills and never again was naive enough to submit himself to Saul's authority again. Even after Saul apologized, offered crocodile tears, and asked David to come back more than once. David was wise and shrewd enough to recognize that Saul's behavior continued to escalate even after David left the kingdom and physically proved to Saul that he would not harm him even though he could. David was never interested in revenge or following Saul's sinful, petty behavior. And if you want to read more about the dynamics between these two, read 1st and 2nd Samuel. But this is the example, not only a king anointed by God set for us as an example of how to na navigate abusive relationships, even ones that uh, involve authority. But King David has been heralded as one of the best, if not the best, earthly king there ever was. So if you need a, a better example on how to navigate uh, abusive relationships, I, I challenge you to find a better example than King David with King Saul. Uh, but let's get back to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. The word rendered in English as slave is the Greek word oiketes which is a term for a household servant. It comes from the word oiketes. K-O, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing these things. I do not speak Greek. But that means to inhabit and dwell. And that is why the Strong's Concordance defines this word as a fellow resident. It is not the Greek word doulos, which is a lifelong uh, bond slave without any ownership rights. So the vocabulary choice here is emphasizing the dignity of personhood of a servant. God is not calling people trapped by circumstance into a lifetime of abuse. You might challenge that last statement by saying, but if you read the context of the remaining verses in 1 Peter chapter 2, you're going to see the example that is being appealed to is the cross, and indeed it is. Let's, let's just read it really quickly. S Slaves, be subject to your masters with all reverence, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are perverse for this finds God's favor if because of conscience towards God someone endures hardship suffering unjustly for what credit is it if you sin and are mistreated and endure it but if you do good and suffer and so endure this finds favor with God for this you were called since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When he was maligned, he did not answer back. When he suffered, he threatened no retaliation, but committed himself to God who judges justly. He himself bore our sins and his body on the tree that we may cease from sinning and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. You were going astray like sheep, but now you have turned back to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Okay, fair enough. This passage absolutely is appealing to the cross. But keep in mind that Jesus died on the cross. He did not live there. It's one thing to suffer minor injustices in relationships because there is no one righteous, no, not one, according to Romans 3.10, which is a quote, uh, from the Old Testament. But that means that in order to have any long-term relationship of any kind, we have to reciprocate grace. But danger and abuse kills. A shrewd person will run and hide from physical danger and abuse. But what about emotional, psychological, and or spiritual abuse? Are we called to allow believers who have allowed the Holy Spirit to dry up to destroy us? Well, 
Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 says that's not even being loving or spiritual spiritually edifying uh, for to do that to the perpetrator, let alone the victim. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 says, When a sentence is not executed at once against a crime, the human heart is encouraged to do evil. So if you allow people to do crimes against you, now this is more than just, you know, minor, you know, uh, suffering and putting up with each other um, when, you know, there's misunderstandings. When, when you ignore crimes that people are doing against you, you are encouraging them to sink deeper and deeper into evil. Um, now that said, I can tell you that out of reverence for my God, I did do my best to honor these passages, especially in the end of my marriage. Now keep in mind, I was never in a physically abusive relationship or I would have divorced sooner. Um, but I did my best to allow my husband to destroy me, thinking that that's what it would take for God to bless my marriage particularly my last round of Christian marriage counseling. This was my logic. I allowed my husband's behavior to go unchallenged, minimized, and or excused by the pastor and his wife in our marriage counseling to the point that my ex's secret sex life, which spanned the entire length of the marriage to varying degrees, it was never exposed, none of it. I allowed them to falsely accuse me of projecting a non-existent past sexual trauma onto my husband. I allowed them to malign me as a domineering nag. And I did not re retaliate by launching counter fal false accusations or by trying to malign them as uncaring or malicious. In fact, I've already stated in my nagging thoughts titled, why I run my mouth that I think they were in fact doing their best to love me according to their ma marriage and gender theology. My husband's behavior, especially at the end of my marriage, felt as if he was ripping my heart out of my chest, throwing it on the ground, and the marriage counseling felt as if the pastor, his wife, and my husband were doing donuts over it in a monster truck with the license plate, love and respect on it. I responded by picking up my smashed heart and and I kept trying to put it back in place only to repeat the same routine. God was my witness, which gave me the strength to allow them to destroy me. God sustained me way past what I even thought I was capable of enduring. But then in God's grace, he delivered me from my oppressors through divorce. I allowed them to crucify, so to speak, I allowed them to crucify me because of my love for God, my husband, and even for the love of the pastor and his wife. But once my destruction was complete, I was free. This is why I say Jesus died on the cross. He didn't live there. You can convince me that it's right to allow people to call you out on your profession of love, but you're going to have a hard time convincing me that the person that would do such a thing actually loves you. But doesn't that mean, if you read the passage, doesn't that mean that the abusers will see your pure and reverent behavior and be won over? Well, that is the topic for next week. So I hope you'll join me for that. I want to thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. I hope you guys have a great week. I apologize for the ambient noise. I am um, uh, traveling and I'm in New York and that's what it is. Anyway, thank you again for your time. God bless.